Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. In the spirit of the trees, in the spirit of living nature, make ourselves aware once again of the crimes against humanity, if you will, that the United States of America has committed against the indigenous peoples uh, that were here uh, on the. So we're going to read today, everyone of Leonard Pelletier, and we're gonna do so with two people uh, who uh, uh, suffer pride, and in particular, if you can find him, feel your way to Leonard Pelletier, and send as much love and support and compassion as you can to this single man. Jack, I wanna welcome you to Humanity Rising. Um, and I suggest, uh, you know, we start with you, Sharon, uh, and for both of you, just tell us your, a little bit more about your background and, and uh, how you got involved with uh, this case and why you found it so compelling that you've really dedicated your, your life in a substantial way to bringing freedom uh, to the single solitary man. So we'd like to hear your story and then bring whatever information that you would like our global community uh, in over 130 countries uh, to know about Leonard and, and what we can do. I've put a number of links in the chat already, everyone that uh, encourage you to uh, click on so you can learn more, uh, including uh, uh, Sharon's book, I Will. Uh, so Sharon, let's just start with you. Welcome. Thank you. Beautiful meditation, I appreciate that. Um, there's so many stories in the Leonard Peltier story, so I'm gonna pick one. He has many names. One of his names, Gartholus, which was given to him by a clan mother in Canada, was a name that had belonged to her grandfather. The name means he who draws the people to him. It's a very specific thing. I began to meet people that knew him and knew of his story. Um, I knew so little at the time that a Cherokee friend brought the story to me while I was living in Georgia. I actually wrote down the name Leonard Pale Tear, thinking that that was what I was hearing. My husband came home from work who was an attorney and I said, I heard a very interesting story today about a man named Leonard Peltier. He said, could you be saying Leonard Peltier? And I said, you know. He said, no one has graduated from law school in America that hasn't heard of the Peltier case. So I found that to be very intriguing right away. He was drawn to it for different reasons. We all are. It, it tells our own story in a unique way. Um, there's an expression a friend used recently, C.P. Benhaim. Um, it was beautiful. She said, light comes through the crack. And what she could see in Leonard Peltier's story through his paintings was a very vibrant, very positive person. He was almost lifted off the ground. He was going through the bars. He was becoming the eagle he was painting. I just loved that one. I thought, the light will come through the crack. And that's the Leonard Peltier story. That was the story that originally grabbed me. Um, I was reminded at that time by my husband who was an attorney, there is no way to get in to meet Leonard Peltier. You need a Senator. And even then you're probably not gonna get in. So put down the book In the Spirit of Crazy Horse by Peter Matheson, which I was reading daily. You're not gonna ever meet Leonard Peltier. And of course, my response was always, if I'm supposed to, I'll meet him. So sure enough, um, after a few phone calls with Leonard through the Cherokee friend, um, I got to meet him like a year later. There was a prison powwow that a local Potawatomi organized for the prison as part of their rights, their religious rights. And oddly, just, you know, these arbitrary rules that will happen with a prison system. They said, we're going to let you invite anyone you want that's not on your visiting list, which excluded all of his family and all of his closest friends and all the movement leadership. It included me because I was not allowed on his 
visiting list. So all of a sudden my name could go on a list and I'm going through a tunnel underground in Leavenworth, passing brick and cement, and then hearing this ancient drum sound that was playing in this gymnasium. Um, my first thought when I heard the drum, for I'd heard it at powwows, but it just resonated through that whole prison with this positive sound. I thought to myself, I'm in this a lot longer than I probably imagined. <laughs> so, yes, that was that was the beginning. I was um, coming off a play that I had written about the AIDS Memorial Quilt that had been adapted into a musical. And I shared that with Leonard in our first phone call, my prior work. I remember his response was, you have a bridge all through that story. And yes, it was the Golden Gate Bridge, which is kind of prominent in the story. The story happens kind of around the bridge. He said, to me, it sounds like a bridge back to humanity for those folks. And I thought, wow, we're going to be good friends. He's got a very beautiful way of seeing something from a very gray, dark hole. I mean, I always imagined with the noise in the background and the long lines he had to stand in to get to a phone and the minutes you're allowed to speak, he wanted to hear the positive things, he responds to them. So that began the journey of hearing his story. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, it was a very famous case. Your husband was right. You know, he's not a law <laughs> student that graduates that doesn't know about Leonard Pelletier. Absolutely. That was a very famous uh, case. Jack, what was your, uh, a little bit more about your background and how did you get involved with uh, uh, Leonard's uh, case? Well, I'm from the Boston area. I'd refer to myself as a Boston Kennedy liberal Democrat. <laughs> uh, but, me too uh, yeah I, I, real quick uh, I met uh, some native women many years ago uh, from they were Oglala women from Pine Ridge we were in New York at a gathering for Leonard and they heard me speak and they said are you from Boston and I said yes and they asked me do you know uh, Robert Kennedy and I said, I don't know him personally, but he's one of us and we love him. And they told me that they had never had electricity at Pine Ridge 70 years after the state of South Dakota got electricity. But it was Bobby and Jack Kennedy who got them electricity. So they always you know, had that connection and they loved, loved them for that. But I was at a powwow in Mashpee with the Mashpee Wampanoag people. Uh, on Cape Cod, and I heard a lawyer speak. Uh, his name was Louis Gerwitz, Lou Gerwitz. He was from Boston, Cambridge, and he was there to talk about Leonard. I had never heard of Leonard's name. This was 1976 or so, I think. And uh, by the time I had finished hearing him, um, I just walked up to him and I said, how can I help? And he said, well, give me a number and maybe, you know, let's see. So we connected. And before too long, I was in a car with him driving to Los Angeles for Leonard was on trial out there. And uh, Lou was a kind of a very grassroots guy, a big, tall guy. He's gone now. But uh, he drove, he had like a, the old fashioned circuit judges. He would drive through Indian country. We would go up to Wisconsin and stay with people there. He didn't stay in hotels. He'd never had the money to. Um, drive down to Big Mountain where he was representing the Navajo people and he would wind up in Canada representing the Cree people. And, and that was the life he loved. But uh, he died too young. And Leonard used to tell him, Lou, charge people for your work. Um, don't, you know, get plane tickets, you know, you, it's too much for you to be driving, but he actually loved it. He loved that they would have sweat lodges and beautiful meals and singing and drumming. And he tuned, he was very tuned into that. Um, so I've worked with him as a paralegal in one of Leonard's trials in Los Angeles. 
That was the first time I met Leonard. I had written to him for a while before that because, uh, you know, Lou had given me his mailing address at uh, Marion. Um, when Leonard first went to prison, they put him in Marion, uh, which was the harshest prison in this country. Uh, they had what they called behavior modification cells and mind control units. Some of them were so uh, low in height that you, a man could not stand up straight. Uh, some of them were soundproof. Um, and Leonard spent about three years in isolation there. But uh, the first time I met him was in Los Angeles through glass windows on a telephone. And... Uh, but we were about the same age back then in our early 30s. And uh, I love the, uh, uh, the camaraderie of it all. Uh, Native people came from all over the country, from Big Mountain, from uh, South Dakota, from Minnesota, from up, up in Hoopa, up in California. Um, Cesar Chavez sent some of his people they had a prayer vigil on the grass in front of the Los Angeles federal courthouse. Um, and uh, at any rate, I got to talk with, you know, sort of speak through the glass with Leonard for about six weeks every day. Um, and then when that trial was over, uh, I went, you know, I went, went on with my life, but I never stopped working for Leonard and being in touch with him. And when I finally met Sharon, interestingly, it was at Leavenworth. I used to tell people I was in Leavenworth doing 20 years for bank robbery. But as, as it happened, we were actually both there on the same day to see Leonard, the day she described with the powwow. That's gotcha. so That's how I met Sharon. And uh, we've been <laughs> collaborating ever since. But uh, yeah, so I've known Leonard a long time since he was a young guy lean and mean and always a happy guy. Um, all the, the trial in Los Angeles, if I could describe it to you, the front rows were all elderly, all el elder Native people. Roberta Blackgoat and three other elders from Big Mountain, Philip Deer, Leonard Crow Dog, uh, Ernie Peters. Uh, and there were always medicine people around there. Uh, uh, we had a prayer vigil on the grass in front of the old uh, courthouse for the whole six-week trial. Um, but that's how I that's how I met Leonard. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, why don't we just back up now? And thank you for your very rich introductions. I loved always to hear people's stories because there's so much synchronicity and seems almost accidental that you. But then only in hindsight do we realize that, that there was a divine guidance uh, mm -hmm. that, that led us to where we are today. But um, let's uh, maybe you could start, Sharon. Why don't we just back up and, and talk about the American Indian movement in the 1970s, the Wounded Knee uh, experience, um, and, and, and what was going on and how Leonard was involved, uh, you know, and, and, and all the way to the uh, altercation with the FBI, just lay out for our audience, both sort of the context, and then the narrative, the story. And then once we do that, then let's talk more about the case, um, and uh, how that has traversed, and then the uh, movement globally, uh, to free him from prison. But let's just start with the story. Just tell us what happened. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, the way you've laid that out in a very clear way. Um, the altercation that jumped out at me right away was all the other way around. Alcatraz had happened, which I don't know if you're familiar with the Alcatraz occupation. Where so tell us Indians. about it. Just lay it out Thank for you. the audience who Absolutely. may not have been born then or remember. I, I remember it myself because I'm a little older, sure. but just tell that story. Okay, good. Um, there was a group of Indian people and many groups of Indian people across the country nationally that took a look at occupying federal land that had been abandoned. It was part of the treaties that if this land had been abandoned over a period of years, it could be returned to native people. So a group of people in San Francisco 
There were native people gathered. Oakland decided we're going to go into Alcatraz. It was beautiful. It was successful. It was peaceful. John Trudell had a radio station called Alcatraz Free Radio. And so people every day tuned into, wow, we're learning things about the indigenous people of America and we're hearing it for the first time. So the whole country kind of got turned on with that experience. It also got on some radars, as you can imagine. I once saw a newspaper article, San Francisco Chronicle, that said Congress may declare war on Alcatraz Indians. I mean, <laughs> having lived in San Francisco, I just thought, wow, that's so over the top. So what it did was really bring some incredible awareness and was one of a few first actions. There were others. Her palace out of Milwaukee occupied the McKinley Coast Guard Station. Interestingly enough, Leonard Pelter will be joining him a year later, but this is earlier. A handful of people went in. We're talking five to seven. Um, they occupied it, but they got something that, that is really wonderful. They got an advocate in Washington. Bradley Patterson agreed with them and took their side. He was working in the President Nixon administration. He was an Indian advisor. He said, wow, let's give the land back. Let's give it to them. And it happened. And it was a beautiful resolution and shows the difference when there's an advocate from when it's an adversary, peaceful, beautiful experience. I have to tell you the timing, like you were saying that every story has that life of its own and is telling. We just saw recently the big documentary is coming out about a school that was formed, an Indian school that first held their classes in a flat and then moved it to that occupation. They're now a school 50 years old, protecting languages and culture, $350 million endowment on 17 acres. It all just grew and grew and grew. And a lot of people don't hear about these wonderful you know, successful events. They It wasn't just gathering or making a point. Over time with advocates and a lot of hard work, beautiful things have happened. Leonard Peltier is working as a mechanic in Seattle. He first lived in a tent outside of an uncle's house, Uncle Billy, and picked apples. He, Leonard's always ambitious. His paintings today prove that. He, he will take nothing and make something very, very beautiful out of it. So he goes into Seattle, he gets a boat chain, he gets a partner, he applies for a business loan and he opens his own company. He's working as a mechanic. Something very what beautiful. Year is this? What year is this? 1969 is the okay. article about it that we have. Something beautiful happened, not just too long ago. I wanna say during the period of time that I was looking for articles for the book, Jack McGee, found this article, turns out a reporter traveling in Seattle, wrote the story and interviewed Leonard and calls him Leonard Peltier, the businessman. I started crying when I looked at it because I thought, had a beautiful picture of Leonard and his partner. He talked about how Indian people could work their way out of the red ghetto, work hard, get jobs, we'll give you a job. This positive guy and, and when I brought it to Leonard's attention, I said, we found the article, your picture's there. And it was all like you said, and I said it kind of that way. I'll never forget because he turned and looked at me, he said, what, you didn't believe me? <laughs> and I told you I was working as a man. I thought, I did, but it's so hard to back out of that. Exactly. Image they so want to put in your head and keep there. So, um, I'll just throw in one other comment because I really loved it. I went to Chief Wilma Mankiller's home in Tahlequah, Oklahoma years ago, and she was a big Pelter supporter. I was meeting her for the first time. She said, to look at you, I wouldn't think you'd even know what the Leonard Pelter story is. And I smiled at her down the table and I said, well, it's not about Leonard Pelter. It's about what put him in there and what keeps him in there. And she said, well, you might know. So we... <laughs> We got to laugh off that because we shared that the story just gets bigger. It becomes your story and all, you know, that's listening can relate to how do you get out of the hole if you're in it? So at this point in the story, Leonard's thriving, has a good life. 
he starts to hear about the Indian problems that they're facing with the fishing struggles in that part of the country. Why is he in Seattle when he was born in Turtle Mountain, North Dakota? Because there was a relocation program that happened during his parents' era that they started giving people jobs into cities and trying to get them off the reservation. And also a termination policies where they were gonna terminate the reservations. I hope that's not too much information to throw. No, 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 this is right fascinating. Away. The more detail, yes, the so better. It, it, um, I found it extraordinary that Leonard Peltier leaves Turtle Mountain in an old Chevy over the Wolf Pass and this incredible journey, which is a story into itself, and arrives and he's picking apples. Where he goes to, Klamath Falls, now there's over 560 at the moment, they keep growing that number, recognized tribes, they're also under termination threat. Okay, he's come from a place where he's hearing they wanna terminate us. He's landed in a place where he hears people are being terminated. And then when he joins the movement and comes to Milwaukee, back to that McKinley Coast Guard Station occupation, a year later in the story, the Menominee in Wisconsin were under termination. They had three nations they're trying to terminate. It's interesting to me that Peltier is landing in those three. And that just jumped out at me. Just like, what would it be like to hear that and feel like hearing it wherever you go? So he joins the movement over in Navajo country. He sees that there's police brutality. He certainly knows the backdrop of the rights and the many years that the movement has been trying to get attention to native rights um, and termination. He joins, he comes back with her palace to Milwaukee and there opens an employment agency for Indians and the AIM office. Again, something that I just didn't hear anyone talking about. It was, you can imagine trying to save his life every day that his representation is hitting on the malfeasance and the trials that were called into question and he's in a desperate place. What was getting left out was this incredible humanity to me, the story of a boy and he's stopping at his Aunt Ida's. She's a teacher on the Crow Nation and she's saying, oh, those fishing struggles, help those people. He gets there with another auntie that he's staying with, help those people, you know, and Leonard was a helper anyway. He didn't need much encouragement. I found it unique in storytelling that I had grandmothers that would say, stay home, don't get into trouble. You know, that's not our business. He had grandmothers that say, the people need our help, get out there. Mm -hmm. I thought that was awesome. I mean, it was like, wow. And these strong women that were part of the leadership always, the grandmother jumping bulls and many others you'll hear about. So at this point in stage, he has his own shop, he's comfortable, he's got a car, he's working hard, he puts it all at risk, joins the movement because people need their help, they need everyone's help. And Dennis Banks and the founders of the movement were crossing the country after Alcatraz looking for leadership, looking for potential because they were figuring out in Minneapolis, we can't do it all. We've got to go find the potential leaders. So her palace and Dennis Banks come to Los Angeles. Speeches are being made. Seattle, all the subsequent areas, people are gathering. Not unlike what becomes the trials with the gathering that Jack just described later. The elders, everyone's showing up. And... Um, we have some beautiful pictures of that. It just, it moves you beyond words. And everything is just about, you know, stop the termination. It's not an imagined threat. And there's a moment in the book that I quoted something I heard Dennis Banks say at a tribunal in Milwaukee. He, when people say termination, how can they terminate you? You're standing here, you know. He says, I want that question asked. Our cultural identity will be terminated. We will no longer identify as American Indian. How can that happen when the bones of our ancestors are buried in every corner of these United States? Mm. We need everybody. Stand up. Just get up. We'll stand up. 
held us. And so these pleas coming from grandmothers and elders, and you can see Leonard Peltier said, I'm joining. Yeah, I mean, so he's one of many mm -hmm. at that point. And then and, what were the events that led to a uh, wounded knee? Well, thank you. He goes to Milwaukee and becomes part of what Herb Palace called third chapter in. I love their license plates because they always say three, aim three or third chapter in. There was Minneapolis with the Bell Courts and Dennis Banks. And that's chapter one and two. I do have to occasionally put in some of Leonard's jokes. I once said one and two. So St. Paul in Minneapolis, I said, that's really one chapter, right? He said, tell the people Minneapolis that, that they're not, <laughs> that they're not chapters one and two. Very distinctly different chapters. And then chapter three was Milwaukee. Leonard gathers with her palace and his family, comes to Milwaukee, joins and stays there. And there, interestingly enough, while at a diner, this is during the occupation of the Coast Guard station, which is very favorable at this point, again, with the advocate in Washington. But people are local, state police, federal police, looking for people that are in the movement. And Leonard gets set up at a diner where he's arrested. And later, many, many years later, when the trial happens against him, they use that incident to say he's always in trouble. You know, you know how that can work. It's sure. like, what? Tell the whole story. He was running an employment office. So anyway, this is in the summer of 71. 72, the following year, when Leonard joins the occupation, they're preparing for something called the Trail of Broken Treaty. It's going to be a walk, not unlike what they envisioned Martin Luther King was able to do. Let's end in Washington in a peaceful way, have all these Native people join. Let's go across country and build this with the leadership and find leaders, circle back around and come into Washington and present our case, the 20 points, which I would like Jack McGee to go over. He, it's a very special document that they were gonna present that said, we have rights. The treaties aren't an idea, they're law. We, you can't terminate us, you can't cancel our culture. We're gonna stand up. And that Washington event culminated into the BIA building occupation, which, you know, became troublesome in that riots. BIA was, is the you know, Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? Yes, I'm sorry, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They hadn't necessarily attended, intended on going there, but as you read in many different stories documented in many books, mine's the short story of it, they needed housing. There was a document that was put out that they got a hold of, a memo in those days, that said anyone who is offered housing, churches, government buildings, anyone, rescind it. We don't want them in town. It's the week of the reelection of President Nixon and we want them out of here in essence. And so they go to get housing, which is offered and it builds into this occupation. That puts them on the newspapers all over the world. I mean, now that reelection, you can imagine a lot of factors made that one stand out. They go to South Dakota from there. Now we're in January of 1973. February, wounded knee occupation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have that 70 day. And then we see a buildup that is referred to by many as the reign of terror post wounded knee. Now these factions are not, there are no advocates. Press are not allowed in a lot of factors. It's a big story unto itself. And that was the wounded knee of 72. And Jack, if you wanna jump in here with any clarity yeah, Jack, there. <laughs> is there any texture you would yeah. like to add? Cause wounded knee was such a famous event. Yeah. And it was really the precursor to Standing Rock uh, right. a, a few years ago. So. Add some texture to the 
occupation there at Wounded Knee? Well, there had been uh, one of the one of the results of residential schools and uh, terminations, uh, relocations was you wound up with two different kinds of native people, I guess, or that you know, unfortunately, it split people. So uh, the Oglala Sioux Tribe at Pine Ridge had a chairman who was a very conservative guy, short hair. Uh, wanted to open up the land for uh, mining, uranium mining in particular. And on the other side were the quote unquote traditionals who were the old people who had long hair and the young people who had long hair and so on. So they had asked AIM to come to the reservation because of this ongoing conflict. The tribal chairman, Dick Wilson, had a... Uh, um, a group of vigilantes, more or less, they called the Goon Squad. And there were literal violence went on for several months, actually several years. Uh, 65 people wound up being killed. And almost all of them, 99% of them were among on the traditional people's side. Uh, when they got to, to uh, when AIM came to uh, Pine Ridge, uh, invited by several elders. The elders told them, we've been to the state police, we've been to the FBI, we've been to the U.S. Marshals. No one will help us. Will you help us? And they, so then I remember Dennis Banks telling Sharon this story and they were at a place called Calico Hall and uh, they were all kind of sitting around not knowing what to do and some of the elder women said, what are you going to do? To these men, what are you, what are you guys going to do? Your aim, um, and so uh, one of those elderly women said, "Let's go to Wounded Knee," and Wounded Knee was the site of a massacre in, in 1890, which uh, was done by elements of the Seventh Cavalry, uh, General Custer's group, who had been wiped out at uh, Little Bighorn in 1876. So there was real vengeance in mind and they murdered several hundred women and children. Very few men were in that group. And that's a, you know, it's an important center at Pine Ridge's uh, Wounded Knee. That siege, that occupation went on for 71 days. Uh, several people were shot during that. It was Indian people gathered around a little church in a place called Wounded Knee Creek and U.S. Marshals and federal agents gathered around a big perimeter with armored personnel carriers and um, high-powered weapons. Uh, several people were killed. Um, at the end of it, uh, Nixon sent some of his highest ranking people to negotiate. The Mohawks, the Six Nations, Iroquois people sent a delegation to help with the negotiations. And at the end of it, they walked out uh, interestingly, Dennis Banks who, and Russell Means were the, probably the two most famous of them. Uh, Dennis left under cover um, of darkness, and he left, and he uh, he spent several years under cover. He was given asylum by Governor Jerry Brown in California, and spent years in California. He taught school there at DQ University in Davis, California. And he wound up eventually going back to, uh, and he did some time for it. But um, so at the end of the wounded knee thing begins this quote unquote reign of terror. And there's just violence all the time against these traditional people. Mm. Um, and on June 26th of 1975, it all blew up in this uh, shootout that happened at the Jumping Bull Ranch or, or uh, uh, home. Uh, Jumping Bulls were two elderly people. Uh, Harry Jumping Bulls, a descendant of Sitting Bull. And they were ranchers. They had very small, modest cows and horses and so on. And two FBI agents drove onto that land one day uh, in plain cars. And no one has ever been able to prove who fired the first shot. But all the Indians all over the reservation were you know, uh, on high alert and high tension and armed. So when these cars came down that road, violence did break out. 
At the end of the day, three people were dead, the two agents and one Indian man named Joe Stunts, Joseph Stunts. And they tried two other guys, Bob Robidu and Dino Butler, Leonard's cousin, Bob, and another guy who Leonard was with all that day. Uh, Le Leonard had fled to Canada on the advice of his elders, like Sidney Bull had 80 years earlier. Um, but when Butler and Robidu went to trial in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, they were acquitted on grounds of self-defense. And so they went free. And eventually, after a year in solitary confinement in Canada, uh, Leonard was captured in a place called Small Boys Cree, a traditional Cree camp in Alberta, brought to a prison, a very, very old, old uh, stone prison in British Columbia. Spent a year in solitary there. And then he was extradited. Uh, his extradition was um, highly suspect. There were three affidavits known as the Myrtle Poor Bear Affidavits. Uh, believe it or not, the federal government prosecutors presented an affidavit from this uh, obviously mentally challenged woman named Myrtle Poor Bear. The first affidavit said, I know Leonard Peltier. I heard people say he's the one who did it. So that gets turned back from the Canadian government as hearsay. We can't use that. So Evan Haltman, one of the prosecutors, asked for a long uh, recess, uh, winds up with a 10-day recess, goes to Washington, goes to North Dakota, comes back with two other Myrtle Poor Bear affidavits. The second one says... Um, I'm Leonard Peltier's girlfriend. He told me he did it. And the third one says, I was there pounding on his back saying, Leonard, Leonard, please don't do it. And the Canadians were obviously, you know, just dumbfounded about it. Um, up until that point, it looked like they weren't going to extradite Leonard to the States. But they, based on those fraudulent affidavits, they ultimately let, sent Leonard back. His trial should have been in, in Cedar Rapids with Judge McManus, who had ruled on the uh, uh, self-defense. It was moved to North Dakota to Judge Paul Benson, who had a reputation as an Indian fighter. Um, and Leonard was found guilty and given two consecutive life terms. The Canadians insisted when they extradited him that, they, that the U.S. take the death penalty off the table. They would not extradite him unless that was agreed to, which as if you thought about it, if they hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here now talking about Leonard Peltier, mm -hmm. who would have been gone four decades ago. Um, and other than the affidavit, uh, Jack, what, what evidence uh, was put forward? And I'm thinking about the, the two other uh, 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 Native Americans who got off were acquitted because of self-defense. What was different about Leonard's case that he was actually convicted? Because he was not convicted for the murder, as I recall. He was convicted to being an accomplice. So they well, they, they they did a lesser. How how does that? Uh, how, what happened? They actually falsified ballistics evidence and produced quote unquote evidence that said Leonard Peltier's gun fired the fatal rounds. Um, and it wasn't until years later in what we, what is called the October 2nd teletype, we found that the evidence that they had done the test and it did not connect Leonard's. So that's how they convicted Leonard. Um, that was the really only evidence. There were no, there were, there was a couple of young boys who were 16 years old, who were kind of coerced and threatened and at one point, they said that Leonard went down to the cars, and later they recanted and said they had been, you know, forced to say that by the FBI. Um, but that was really the only thing uh, was the October second teletype, the, the ballistics uh, evidence. Jennifer Bendery, a, a writer for Huffington Post, for your for your listeners, in in today's Huffington Post does a beautiful and very long detailed uh, explanation of the case. Um, how the, the, the case has always been full of holes. Um, 
we just you know we watch Leonard do the time, but uh, uh, it, you know it's it's just sad. He's survived by painting, although he hasn't been allowed to paint in almost two years because of uh, COVID restrictions. He's had COVID. He had COVID about three months ago. Thankfully, he survived it okay. He's 77 years of age now. He has diabetes. He's had a stroke in prison. Uh, <clears throat> lost 90%, excuse me, lost 90% of the sight in one eye. Uh, he's had open heart, emergency open heart surgery. Um, he has an untreated abdominal aortic aneurysm. Through Sharon, uh, we connected with Congressman John Lewis and uh, Leonard has had a lifelong maxiofacial jaw problem. And Sharon was able to get us meetings with John Lewis and John arranged for uh, Leonard to be brought up to the Mayo Clinic for surgery on his jaw. When, prior to that, if you were talking to Lenny, I always had a paper cup in his hand. His jaw was kind of deformed from a beating he took earlier, and he would have to turn his head and spit. Um, we advocated, we lobbied for years for better food for him because he's diabetic, even at one point asking if they might puree his food because of his jaw. They were laughed, that was laughed at. Uh, he eats his meals mostly out of uh, vending machines. Uh, now, uh, the prison he's in is very violent. There's a lot of gang warfare there, and he's. Uh, this is Leavenworth. Uh, he's in Leavenworth now. Today he's in a prison called Coleman One, USP Coleman One in Florida. Oh, and that raises an interesting question. The federal prison guidelines say that you should. Um, that the prison bureau of prison should attempt, if at all possible, to put a prisoner within 500 miles of his home. And that's so that there can be some semblance of rehabilitation, that they could at least see their family and maybe, you know, hold on to some humanity. And uh, Leonard is 1,900 miles from his home. So he very, very, very rarely gets visits from family. Um, We've been working for years to try to get him transferred up north. And uh, at very, the warden at one point signed off on it. His security level has been lowered. Uh, he's eligible to be in a medium security prison where he'd have much more access to the world. Um, and, uh, but it seems like even when the warden at Coleman approved his transfer somewhere upstream, it gets blocked. Yeah. Um, there was a the parole hearing you mentioned in Leavenworth. He was approved uh, of, for parole. And the man who was the head of that parole hearing was uh, demoted and, and uh, moved to his, uh, transferred to another area. That had, and uh, another thing, Jim, you mentioned very important. He's convicted of first degree murder two counts, and years later, when we come with, with the October 2nd teletype proving it was not his gun, uh, that's when uh, at one of the parole hearings, the lawyer said to prosecutor Lynn Crooks, hold on, hold on, hold on. You've been saying all along, this guy is a cold-blooded murderer. You have proof that he walked down and shot those agents. And Crooks begins to waffle and says, well, I don't care if what they say is true and all that. My conscience doesn't bother me one bit. He used the word conscience four times in one sentence. Uh, this was on 60 Minutes. But um, it's like, it doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter if what they say is true on that. So yeah. that's, when the, that's when they began to say, uh, when Crooks admitted, we don't know who shot the agents. We know we didn't prove Leonard Peltier shot the agents. They begin to say it's he's he was uh, he's being held on aiding and abetting, and then that raises the question of who did he aid and abet? You can't aid and abet yourself. His two co-defendants were were found not guilty by 
reason of self-defense. So now that's where he's at. He's, he's in prison for two life terms for aiding and abetting an unknown entity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the FBI, you know, with two FBI agents dead, had to find somebody uh, yeah. to punish. And two of them were acquitted. And that just left Leonard. And so the full weight of the U.S. government has come down on his head uh, yeah. with, uh, with a fury that is implacable. Uh, and it's interesting. That's why, you know, he would say it doesn't bother my conscience because he knows what the truth is, but they had yeah. to get somebody to pay. Right. That's... And interestingly, over the years, uh, did I interrupt you, Jim? Were you going to say something else? No, 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 no. That's it. That was it. Uh, in the 90s, Judge Gerald Haney, who presided over Leonard's appeal in the Eighth Circuit Court, uh, ruled against Leonard, but as soon as he retired, he called it the most difficult decision he had to make in 22 years. And uh, he was obviously bothered by it. He wrote to Senator Daniel Inouye of Hawaii, who is the chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs. And they joined forces in saying the time for healing has come. The FBI, in fact, uh, Haney said the FBI was at least as much at fault for starting the fight. Mm -hmm. Um, so that happened. And more recently, J uh, James Reynolds, who was a U.S. attorney in North Dakota, who presided over the case and literally was one of the main people who put Leonard in prison, he's come forward and written to Joe Biden. And he says, obviously, Peltier's case was flawed. We cut corners. He didn't want to maybe come out and talk about the ballistics, but um, the a reporter asked him, what would you say to Leonard Peltier if you had the chance to talk to him? He said, I would tell him, I'm sorry. We mm. couldn't do him more to, to help get you out of there. Mm. And he's mm. written to Joe Biden. Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, the senior U.S. senator, has written to Biden. Mm. Uh, Sharon introduced uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu to Leonard, set up a phone call with him with uh, Archbishop Tutu, he, Arch, he liked to be called Arch. He was a beautiful, beautiful man. He loved Leonard. They spoke on the phone and he advocated. Uh, uh, Sharon wrote a series of, of uh, things, PSA is called I Will Ask. And if any of your listeners, you know, in, in the future, go to YouTube and type in I Will Ask Leonard Peltier and Archbishop Tutu appears in the number of Carlos Santana, Jackson Brown. In fact, I don't know, Jim, if you have that. Uh... Yeah, well, I put them in the in the chat. Uh, Sharon, uh, tell us a little bit more about those, and also uh, bring in some a uh, texture to the global campaign because it was Nelson Mandela, it was Mother Teresa, it's been the Dalai Lama, there's been the Pope involved. It's an exercise in yeah. everybody. I mean, yeah. it's a, you know recently Ringo Starr. Did a PSA Ringo. Even Ringo. saying, sure. I will ask Danny DeVito, Mark Ruffalo. I mean, and, and what's incredible is all the people with their feet on the ground, you know, their heart close to it, that stay with Leonard day in and day out, which there are thousands of unnamed, wonderful people that show up on Twitter and share their hearts. And, mm. and Leonard hears about it and it makes the impossible possible. Um, one of the things that Leonard, as I hear about his medical conditions, and I go back to that moment with Congressman Lewis, it was an incredible moment where he kind of teared up with Jack because they started talking about Selma and, and he was determined to help Leonard get out of pain because he was having migraines every day. But what I noticed at the time, being a young mother at the time, I can't stand a migraine headache. I was like, there must be something that we can do. And so when we went to John Lewis, thanks to a local amnesty rep, Reed Jenkins is the one who got us into the office. And Jim, my husband had the medical records, stacked them all high. And Congressman Lewis was hesitant to tell him he'd received a letter back from the prison saying there was no medical problem and no complaint of any. And I remember Jim's mouth just kind of opening and he looked so shocked, really beyond words. 
And literally Congressman Lewis patted his knee and said, it's okay, it's okay. Like you're not used to hearing them lie to a congressman. Mm. I'll handle it from here. And he started writing a letter, composing a letter saying, I'm gonna get a panel of congressmen and we're gonna go Leavenworth and check for ourselves. Overnight, Leonard was flown to the hospital and given the surgery that took him out of that painful situation. So I just wanted to interject the incredible heroes that have been behind the scenes and at great risk Mm -hmm. fighting a system that they too knew, wow, it doesn't matter who we bring in, you know, this capricious moment, oh, wow, it doesn't bother my conscious one whit. Well, it bothers ours. And it bothers a whole lot of good people. And in the end of the day, that's going to be the voice of reason. Another moment with democracy now, which I am leading up to meeting Jack Healy for the first time, which was your question. (laughs) Um, Forgive me, we suffer from too many stories here, but it was great because Leonard phoned pretty often in those days to find out is anything going on. And so there was a press conference at the Beacon Theater where all these performers had gathered. Jack McGee produced the concert and Common was there and Mos Def and Belafonte and Pete Seeger and just a wonderful group of people. Hurricane Carter Mm. showed up and had his habeas corpus in his pocket. You know, I don't travel without this. He said, I swore I would never come into a city again because I'm aware that on every other block men are being held in a cell and I can't help them. And it just drives him crazy. He says so, but for Leonard Peltier, he came into New York that night to come up on that stage. And it was a beautiful thing. The next day we had a press conference and Democracy Now! was on the mic and Leonard called in the, I was in the coat room and saw the name come across. And I thought, I can't talk right now, Leonard, we're holding a press conference. And then it occurred to me, the rules, if he doesn't know about it and didn't organize it in any way, he's allowed to talk on a phone. And I thought, oh my. And I hit the button and um, Lorna Tucker, who was there, a documentary filmmaker, very gifted, she runs down to... And there he is on stage with everyone talking. But this is the funny part. He was prompted. You're on the phone. What would you ask President Obama right now if you could? Anything. Well, I think he first says, where's Sharon? You know, I thought, great. You just proved you knew nothing about this. You know? <laughs> and <laughs> we're, you're safe. And he said, what would I say? I would say, get rid of those drones that are hurting children. What are you thinking, man? And he went into this whole political, and it's like, he's thinking of others. He's an activist. He's not thinking of himself. He didn't say, I mean, they had to actually bring him around to, would you ask for clemency? You know, I just thought that was a beautiful moment because, you know, Leonard is always the activist first. Exactly. That's what he deals with every day, whether he's painting a story on the canvas and drawing the people to him through painting, or all of us, or a president. Help those children stop that, you know, is what hits his mind, so. Well, at this this point, you know, as we bring this to a close here, uh, for both of you, what what can ordinary people do? What can our community do to support? Is is it effective to write letters uh, to Leonard, for example, to the president? Uh, How can people support this? Well, um, we have a Twitter account, it's at Peltier HQ, and you can join in on Twitter, and frequently we, we post things that say... Say again, them, Jack, at? At Peltier HQ. Q, I just, HQ, okay, I just put it in the chat. Okay, okay. and frequently we, we post, uh, uh, call the White House comment line. Um, you know, uh, Senator Leahy of Vermont, who's a pretty moderate guy, sure. uh, a good guy by all accounts, you know, but we had, we've had grassroots people in Vermont calling his office forever. And I think, you know, no disrespect to him, but because he's retiring for the first time, he's really been speaking right out about Leonard. It's a little easier, I guess, but uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we call you a congressman, uh, Jamie Raskin, uh, uh, congressman, a lot of people who helped Leonard over the years, Don Edwards of California, Ron Dellums, um, Kurt Vonnegut, Peter Mathis and Mandela. These people are gone. Leonard's been in prison since the end of the Vietnam War. Yeah. 46 years now. 46 um, years. Yeah. And uh, it's as if he, he was crushed when Clinton didn't do anything. We had high hopes for Clinton. We really thought Clinton was going to do it. And then when Clinton didn't, uh, we, uh, we heard from a guy in Leavenworth, an artist, who was inspired, by the way, to become an artist, is now a free man. And he talked about Leonard being crushed and how everyone in the prison felt so sad because he believed he was going home. He gave all those things away. He mm. sent things back to North Dakota. Mm. Um, and Len the guy said, we, you know, this is hardened criminals, quote unquote, you know, but we were all so sad for him. Well, Crystal is just putting in here that uh, the reason was that 200 FBI agents marched into Clinton's office. So the FBI headquarters basically yeah. said to Clinton, no way. Well, they actually marched in front of the White House and it was close to 400, Crystal. Thank you. Oh, uh, but oh. it was closer to 400. And that's what they did. They said, uh, see, Leonard has been a political football, quote unquote, it's, we believe that in Clinton's case, they said, if you do this, a certain senator won't be yeah. reelected. If you do that, we'll withdraw the support of yeah, exactly. all law enforcement exactly. all over the country. And when Obama, who was a, you know, a, a human rights guy, um, a constitutional lawyer, again, Leonard was soaring. You know, we all were. Was, he's yeah. getting out, man. He's getting out. Obama's got to let him out. Yeah. And we heard that Leonard's name was at the very top of the list with Obama. He didn't do it. Didn't and the do next it. day, his, his name was off the list. Yeah. So someone pressured Obama in some kind of way. Yeah. But today's Huffington Post by Jennifer Bendery uh, goes into great deal, detail about how that seems to have happened so often. Mm -hmm. They, You know, there are people who put, Leonard's adversaries put heavy pressure on anyone who wants to help him especially politically. And if I'm, if I may interject, there's a new day, Jim, with the fact that there are judges that have come forward in the past and now a judge is his attorney. And even the Justice Department said, we have to listen to judges because they're inside the sure. justice system. Sure. And sure. he has a point of view from 10,000 feet up Sure. That that no one else had. And he is this amazing judge, Kevin Sharp, because he was appointed for life by President Obama. I say that because he was in this position of power that was secure and he saw what was going on in the prison system with so many. And yeah. he walked away and started a law firm for social justice and people that were desperate and voiceless and death row. I mean, I once told him, wow, you get all these candidates that this is going to be the hardest case you ever had. And then you fall into the Peltier story. Mm -hmm. He's come out just fighting and just, you know, in Excellent. it to win it because he's on the inside and had relationships on Capitol Hill and is taking even further risk, if you will, with, no, he's the one-off deal. He's the one that got away. He's all these things that pointed him out. Any Indian will do whatever they were thinking. Yeah, the answer is yeah. no, because everyone is in it together. In it to win it is his philosophy there. And so Judge Sharp. Good. We have a lot of hope. <laughs> so, well, Sharon and Jack, uh, thank you so much for this uh, time uh, today. Uh, you've provided the history and the context, and you've you've brought the humanity of Leonard Pelletier alive in in all of its dimensions. And your stories of him, uh, Sharon, about. Uh, uh, you know, he's a businessman in Washington, you know, <laughs> helping people and doing various things. He was a real guy. Uh, Can I tell you a very quick story, Jim? Sure. Back, back in Leonard's auto repair shop, 
Sharon uh, knows these stories and has written about them, by the way, in her book, I Will. But uh, Leonard didn't have a tow truck when she mentioned a boat chain, a big, heavy. He would use cars and tie a chain to a bumper of another car. He was well known for fixing the floors of uh, ru rusted out cars for the old timers. He would he was a he's a master mechanic and he was excellent with sheet metal. So he would file, you know, cut. but but a very funny thing happened. One of his uh, elderly aunts said they went to see him one time at the shop. And they, they came up this alley where the, the shop was located and there were police cars everywhere. And she said, oh, my God, you know, they're, what's going on? They must be arresting Leonard or they're raiding the place or something, you know. And, and she said it turned out that he had the contract for the Seattle police to repair their <laughs> cars. <laughs> it just shows you how the world can turn, boy. Uh, it shows you what a guy he was. I mean, he wasn't yeah. a man of recrimination and hostility. Uh, he was just trying as best he could to get along and to thrive. And but to was overpowered by you know, the needs of his people. The events of his times, yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it's not like Moses. Moses grows up the son of uh, Pharaoh in the palace, but was so um, struck by the needs of his people that he went into his opposite and became the, the liberator from the Egyptians, having grown up in the palace of the Pharaoh of the Egyptians. Uh, and that feels a lot of uh, around uh, Leonard's uh, pathway uh, yeah. as well. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, thank you. Any uh, final words, uh, uh, Sharon? Just any final comment you want to make? I do want to thank your listeners and the people that text in. It gives you the backbone because all you can think at a moment like this is the million things you didn't say that were important. Um, there's so much out there on the Pilter story. I think that you framed it beautifully. What an example of a human being that he can take light into a hole, which I recently teased him when I said, you'd probably have the biggest car dealership in Seattle if you hadn't joined the movement at the rate you were going. And he just kind of looked winsome when I said it. And I said, look at it this well, Pelletier, your paintings are worth what cars are worth, you know? <laughs> so even in a hole, he brought in the light yeah. and just kept yeah. hitting it. And he does to this day. He's one of the most cheerful people you'll ever talk to yeah. with all those medical problems that are very real. So thank you for caring and anyone listening that, that cares. We thank really you, appreciate Sharon. you having us. Yeah. Jack, any final word? No, just, uh, well, yes. Um, Please join us. Uh, free Leonard Peltier is how we've uh, always said it. Uh, there's a Robert Redford film called Incident at Oglala that speaks to the story. Kurt Vonnegut was very vocal on Leonard's case. Peter Matheson, the American Book Club uh, Book Award winner, National Book Award winner. Uh, the naturalist Peter Matheson wrote in The Spirit of Crazy Horse. Mm -hmm. But in a concrete way, call your congressman. Tell them that we think this guy needs to be freed and please look into it at least and uh, join us on Twitter. Um, Sharon's book, I Will, is now in bookstores and libraries. It's won several awards. Leonard uh, loves the book, by the way, which was the big test was, would he think it's okay? And he, he loves it. Um, a lot of the and elders- CP's who, book. What's it? CP's uh, book. Yes, yeah, CP Ben Haim of the, of the New York- uh, City Arts New York uh, has a book of a lot of Leonard's paintings, which is out there on Amazon, a beautiful book. And by the way, Sharon is being honored in New York with the uh, Making a Difference Through the Arts Award, which Maya Angelou mm -hmm. won. Congratulations. And, uh, Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thanks so we much. continue every single day to, to push, push and fight and in a respectful way. We're not asking to tear anything down. We just want justice for this man. Um, this revolutionary. Yeah. Someone just put a link in, uh, which I just clicked on, uh, is Leonard uh, uh, telling his own story. It's a YouTube. 
So uh, recommend all the links. Uh, everyone uh, recommend uh, Sharon's book. I will uh, well, recommend. Leonard has it. a book. Uh, excuse me, Jim. Leonard has a book called Prison Writings. Prison my writings. Life is my Sundance. That's available all over, and uh, that is Leonard telling his story. Very beautiful book. Beautiful. Thank you, Sharon, Jack. Thank you very, very much for this uh, uh, time. If there's any updates that uh, you come across, would love to have you back. Uh, we'll continue to support Leonard in every way that we can. Uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership and your indomitable courage and fortitude and perseverance over these decades now as we seek collectively to free a man uh, who uh, is a light to all of us even though he's in a darkness of a prison. So thank you so much for your time and inspiration today. Thank you, Jim, very thank much. You, Jim. And That's all your good. listeners. Thank, thank you, everyone. You're now uh, welcome, those of you who can, to join our after session oh. chat group. Uh, Sharon and Jack, if you can join, uh, the link is in the uh, chat box. Um, and then tomorrow, everyone, we're going to be going to the Vatican uh, to uh, several people who have been. Uh, instrumental in the design and the writing of the Pope Francis's encyclical on the environment, uh, Laudato Si. So that'll be tomorrow um, with someone live from the Vatican here on uh, Humanity Rising. That'll do it for us for today. Thank you so much. Sharon, thank you. Jack, thank you. Bye for now. <laughs>